O'Donnell and this is County Board Wrap Up. Each month we ask the board chair and a guest, of course another board member, about the key decisions the county board took at its monthly meeting. Today we're joined by board chair Jay Fissette, who is making his last appearance here on County Board Wrap. Jay, thank you. I know. Yep. It's bittersweet, I'm sure. Yep. Yep. And of course, joining him today is Board Vice Chair Katie Crystal. Thank you both for being here Not today. Fun. Well, let's start out. The board closed out the year with another very busy meeting, and we're going to start off with taking a look at this housing conservation district. Sure. Um, now, this was a little controversial of a topic, but what made you decide to move forward with this housing conservation district? First, what is it? And sure. then what made you? Well, it, it, I'll start with what's, what led to it, why we did it, and that is that housing affordability is probably our greatest intransigent challenge because of the value of land. And we have seen an incredible deterioration and loss of market rate affordable housing, meaning housing that's affordable to somebody at low and moderate incomes without any subsidy, just through the market. And we've lost thousands and thousands. There are very few left. So are we talking specific corridors all or throughout the all county, throughout Arlington? All throughout okay. the county. Um, so we've always looked for new tools. How can we help preserve or incentivize the preservation of these kinds of affordable units? And in many cases, they're garden apartments, not all. So the staff came up with over the last six months, eight months, a new context, a new uh, a conservation housing conservation district designation. They identified those areas throughout the county uh, that would be considered these districts. And this is the first phase. So the board took action to go ahead and designate these districts, these affordable housing uh, conservation districts. And we also took one other action, and that was within these districts to restrict the conversion of a garden apartment, for example, into a townhouse so without multi, any public multi process. Multi-unit into a single unit. Exactly. Okay. You now have to go through a public process. We didn't take the option away. The option is still there. But as we've done in some other parts of the county, we've recognized that there is no public process to ensure the character of the neighborhoods and the other values that we have in the community. So in, in effect, going forward, and this will be revisited in the next phase, but going forward, that option to someone who owns that land, that's the only change implicit in what we did, is they won't be able to take that property turn their building, uh, level it, turn it into a, a luxury townhouse without going through some community process to make sure it works. Now these districts, as they go forward, are they going to be in specific areas of Arlington? Or are yeah, they kind of scattered? There? 13, I believe they're 12, eight. Eight. Oh, yeah. don't quote us on that. Yeah, <laughs> the number of districts. Several. Yeah. There are several districts and they are throughout the county? Yes, okay. north and south throughout the county. And I'll say one of the issues that arose was along the Lee Highway Corridor. Okay. Uh, because the Lee Highway Corridor is going through, uh, beginning very shortly, uh, a visioning process or a replanning of that corridor. Several of these uh, housing conservation districts are along the corridor. But it's absolutely clear that these districts will not preempt that planning process at all. That planning process will go forward. They'll look at everything in these districts and outside the districts along the corridor and have a uh, full, uh, full range of options to adjust and, and uh, make decisions about the future of the corridor regardless. Now you brought up the, um, some of the development that will be happening along Lee Highway. Are some of the developers who are looking to um, kind of reimagine that area, are they concerned about any of the plans that they may already have in place? Well, I'm not aware of any plans people have in place that this um, dislodges. Uh, on the other hand, those developers, those property owners need to be fully engaged in two things coming up. One is the Lee Highway Corridor planning, um, which will be all stakeholders, and secondly, phase two of this process. Um, so the, the issue of the market of the uh, townhouses and the change to get a townhouse, that will be revisited when phase two comes in. And the staff and the community, developers, citizens, all look at different incentives that could be created, financial or density incentives, to help move us in the right direction of preserving these um, affordable units. But Kara, your point about do we know if the developers have any plans to move forward with some of these conversions actually speaks to why we took this action. We don't have to know, the community doesn't have to know if it's by right. There's no opportunity for us to plan for the impacts or talk about the impacts on the neighborhood character. One of the things that we see with conversion of multifamily garden apartments to single family townhouses is that the impacts on our community are different. 
Uh, and this makes sense, I think, intuitively to folks. They know if you use an area of the county more intensively than it's planned for, we get impacts, more sure. demand for services like parks or things like that. It's also true the other way around. If we've planned an area of the community to serve multifamily, we've planned our transportation around that, we've planned our school impacts, et cetera, around it. And for this use to go forward by right without anyone in the county tracking it or having any community process really doesn't give us an opportunity to plan for those new impacts. And and this change will allow us to go through a process that does. Gotcha. And this is relatively new. This is, in fact, the first co housing conservation district for Virginia, at least. Yeah, it's a, little, a lot of times our staff are so creative. You know, we have challenges. We're breaking new ground with this concept. And phase two will actually put more meat on the bones about what, how it works. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, moving on from housing conservation, conservation to history. historic overlay um, district applications. Uh, the historic district, historic overlay district, um, this was kind of a unique situation. Explain to me a little how this all came about. Absolutely. So the historic overlay district is, of course, another process right. we undertake in the county to determine, as a community, using set standards, um, whether a particular property or series of properties or neighborhoods ought to be designated as historic, uh, with all of the implications, restrictions, opportunities that might entail. And what we've learned is that the standard for requesting an historic designation was pretty low. That threshold was pretty low. Um, an, an individual filing for this designation didn't have to provide much in the way of background materials. They didn't have to do any sort of outreach or get the support of property owners who might be affected. And we've seen actually that create consternation in the neighborhoods and a, a tremendous amount of work for our historic preservation staff. So this was an opportunity to rebalance where that threshold falls, to try to strike a balance between keeping a process that's accessible and participatory, but also make sure that any application, which will be time consuming and will sometimes cause upset and consternation among property owners, is actually uh, comes forward to us with a little more of that community support and groundwork laid before we kick off that extensive process. So in a nutshell, it turns into just kind of creating a set of standards so someone just can't say, my neighborhood's historic. Um, there has to be some, some standards attached to that, some community buy-in through that whole thing. And well, some the documentation. Decision, the decision was always a long process. And this was essentially changing what kicks off a very intensive, labor-intensive okay. analysis by staff, awareness of all the community. And in the past, one person, literally, the rules were one person can say, I want this particular area, which could be large and they might not even live there, to be designated historic. And everyone that lived there got scared. They didn't know what it meant. And it kicked off a large body of work that I think Katie's right. We needed to raise the bar on right. what would start that process. Okay, so we're not saying this is something against historic preservation. No. This is just giving some standards and some guidelines to getting Kicking that Kicking off that going. process, yeah. And notably, one person can still begin this process for a single property. That's okay. important. If you live in a home that you think is historic, uh, if you're part of an organization right. that owns a property that you think is historic, you can still move forward as a resident in Arlington County. The issue is really that where that threshold falls for big multifamily areas, right. or excuse okay. me, big multi-property areas. Multi so, and if it's for an entire neighborhood, Neighborhood, for an example, right. One person those neighbors can't do are that going anymore. to have to kind of rally behind this effort to make get that process underway. Correct. Okay, well, interesting to know, but we're going to take a quick break right now. And when we come back, we'll take a look at an exciting new county initiative to bridge the digital divide. Stay with us. Welcome back to County Board Wrap Up, our monthly chat with county board members about some of the important actions they took at their monthly meeting, actions that affect you, your neighbors, and your community. With us today is always Board Chair Jay Fazette, as well as Vice Chair Katie Crystal. And let's talk about the Digital Inclusion Initiative. Now this is really exciting, that's going to bring more Wi-Fi access to some of our low-income residents and also brings in our Connect Arlington features. So let's sure. kick off talking a little I bit think, about that. I think everybody at the board meeting was really excited to vote for this. Um, you know, when you look at our vision statement, it's about inclusiveness and diversity and equity, and that's what this accomplishes. Um, access to the internet 
is huge these days. It creates a difference in equality of opportunity if it's you don't I have think it. Many of us take for granted. We, uh, many of us take for granted, but not everyone else does. And so we had an opportunity here with the INET or the um, Connect Arlington uh, dark fiber that we have uh, created throughout the county. Uh, at the Arlington Mill Community Center, it goes there, right behind that are the Arlington uh, Mill residences. Uh, run by APA, owned by the Arlington Partnership for Affordable Housing. So there are about 122 units, something around 159 or 60 kids live in these units. And what we have done is provided them, provided APA with some money and the connection to our dark fiber so that every one of those households, every one of those kids will have access to high speed internet. Free and that's money. great for their education. It's great for our community. I was just going to say, the kid, kids especially need, they need internet access now at home yeah. just to do your homework. Sure. Um, so Absolutely. The digital divide is completely correlated with educational attainment, as well as all kinds of other unexpected indicators um, of health and, and, uh, and civic participation, health care. Access to health care has been documented to be differentiated by access to the Internet. Um, and so it's really an opportunity to bridge what is a major social justice and equity issue right now mm -hmm. over time. And this is essentially a pilot program to see how this works, so to three speak. three years. There'll be an analysis. There'll be surveys to make sure, actually check into what those outcomes are. As Katie was just mentioning, not only the how many people access it, how many kids access it, but what did it do? How did it affect their lives? And what are some metrics we can use to look at that? And hopefully that'll prove to be successful and there'll be other opportunities. But this all came, out, came to pass because the county made some very significant investments in creating our own dark right. fiber network. That fiber, as we can see now, affects the digital divide. It also helps our economic development. So there's a great value from that significant investment we've made. It was phase one of Connect Arlington, just going back a few years, we got that dark fiber available in all county buildings. So exactly. uh, county government buildings, the courthouse, schools, what have we you. We were getting it through the Comcast franchise in the past mm -hmm. and then it was going to get expensive. We decided to build our own, but not only build it to avoid that cost um, with the franchise, but to take advantage of it in other ways like this, like using it as an economic development incentive mm -hmm. for businesses for to business. come to Arlington. So it's worked. Because we've had a lot of um, businesses that need that kind of that dark That's fiber, right. that dedicated line for for their work that Absolutely. they do. So Make really them more kind competitive. of unlimited opportunities that will come for us with this dark fiber. Okay, well, from going from fiber to parks, a little bit of an awkward segue, but hey, it's what it is. It's all um, infrastructure. It is all infrastructure. There you go. Thank you. Um, but we approved some framework plans for Benjamin Banneker Park, um, and this is a pretty distinct park. Let's talk a little bit about this project. Absolutely. So Benjamin Van Ecker Park is 12 and a half acres uh, on Sycamore Street in the northern part of the county. Um, and it's a big chunk of land with a lot of implications. Uh, natural resources in that area, access to Four Mile Run and the stream. And so it really came time to think about the future of the park holistically and for the long run. Uh, and that's why we adopted framework and design guidelines for this park, which we're excited to see. They reflect a lot of community input along the way, um, which has become a signature of how we plan our parks as well as other public mm -hmm. facilities. What, what are some of these guidelines that we're looking at? So is this, you know, to, is this replacing some of the amenities of the park, upgrades, expansions? Absolutely, yeah, it's about? some guidelines that uh, will guide uh, how the playgrounds are redeveloped and other park amenities, um, how the trail is reconfigured over time, um, as well as some of the thoughts about plantings that will go into that meadow space that's okay. part of Benjamin Banneker Park um, and others. And this park is a little bit um, special in that it has one of the historic boundary stones um, included in it as well, correct? It does, and it's actually named for uh, a pretty fabulous regional historical figure, Benjamin Banneker, who was the son of slaves and uh, a self-taught mathematician mm -hmm. who was involved in the um, drawing or the survey of the original boundary of the District of Columbia. So uh, it's exciting to see his legacy recognized in this way. Anytime we have a park, you know, and you know, back to the community facility study, limited land, we have to maximize the efficiency of that. So some of this, every time we go do a new framework, a new master plan for a park, it's actually thinking about how you maybe add a little bit to it, how you reorganize, reorient, so you get the maximum use out of it, the, the, the maximum amount of, of uh, usable space right. and amenities. I think we, this has really be become a priority of 
getting you know the available parkland, making the most of that because land itself is at such a premium here in Arlington County. Right. I mean, we're only 26 square miles. It's it, it's some of it's wooded, some of it's natural, some of it's meadow, some of it is you know playground, some of it is fields. So uh, there's a trail that goes mm -hmm. through there that connects to all the other trail system of the county. So how you, you do that in the most efficient way possible. Okay, we're we'll going there too. The, Arling the Design Arlington Awards. What oh, are sure. the Design Arlington Awards? Oh, sure. Yeah, I love this one. Uh, this is something that was created maybe, I'm thinking, 2009, something like that. Uh, we realized that in our planning, which we're known for, we did all the functional things really well. Ingress, egress, density, height, massing, um, streetscape, retail, all, all the functional stuff. But there was a growing concern that we weren't getting enough emphasis on the architecture, some interesting designs. And how important was that you know, to the broader community? Well, um, we are very limited in how we can tell someone to design a building. And, and, and you know, we're all amateurs as well, and, and beauty's in the eye of the beholder. But we decided to do what we could to sort of put a greater emphasis on that. So we held a number of uh, discussion groups. Uh, we had some forums. We brought in some uh, experts in the area, some professionals. We ended up, one of the outcomes of that was a lot of the developers ended up bringing in a higher level architect at the beginning of their project. And we started to see some improvement in that way. Another was to create awards. So every two years now, there's a juried process, applications, I think this year 30 or 40 applications, trying to acknowledge and, and bring to the forefront, to the public view, and express appreciation to those projects that had either outstanding or, or notable architecture or landscape design, uh, uh, historic preservation mm -hmm. features. And that's what we did uh, just the other day. Uh, it was the two-year uh, design awards. They came to the boardroom. We were able to acknowledge them, recognize them. And I think that's the goal, is to actually raise the visibility of architecture and acknowledge those that do a good job. And hopefully others will, uh, will mirror some of that work. I'm just thinking around the county, there are quite a few opportunities, or examples rather, of some just really interesting design, whether it's a nod to a business that used to be on that site, or just something a little different. It just kind of makes the visual landscape a little bit more interesting. Another outcome of that was identifying certain key locations because of their geography, their visibility mm -hmm. at an intersection or with a view corridor. And in those areas, noting that architecture in that instance might be more important, it needs to be thought about earlier on in a process. So, you know, as I say, we don't have a lot of authority, um, but we have different tools that we can create to help incentivize and encourage uh, better, better architecture okay. and design. Thank you. We're going to take one more quick break. When we come back, we'll hear about a significant honor for Arlington. And we're going to talk with Board Chair Jay Fazette about the big goodbye, his decision to retire after 20 years on the county board. Stay with us. Welcome back to County Board Wrap-Up, where each month we take a closer look at some of the key decisions the board takes at each monthly board meeting. Joining us today, as always, and for the final time, is County Board Chair Jay Fassett, joined, of course, by Vice Chair Katie Crystal. Um, but let's talk about, this is very exciting. Arlington has always had a commitment to environmental sustainability, to green building, and now it's really getting a pretty spectacular recognition for this as a lead platinum community. Let's talk about and that. not just a lead platinum community, the first in the nation the, lead platinum community. The lead platinum we community. We are really <laughs> thrilled about this. It's such an affirmation of how hard our community members, our county staff, our county leadership, like Jay, have been working uh, along with our private sector and, and others um, to build a community that is truly sustainable, uh, environmentally aware, uh, well planned in terms of transit and growth, um, and to have that recognized by the United States Green Building Council, um, whose symbol or 
or designation, the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design is really globally recognized um, as a symbol of achievement and sustainability. So we are their first community. Um, there was one city that preceded us, that was our neighbor, the District of Columbia, which we think bodes really well for our region. Um, but to, to see our work recognized in this way, I think, feels like such an affirmation and a reminder that we have more work to do to really stay at that leading edge of um, energy efficiency, sustainability, uh, and good planning. And what were some of the things that uh, the Building Council really looked at when they were making this kind of designation? Is it just a recycling, a green building? What were All some of the above. Things that I mean, they really looked at how we integrate the term sustainability into the work of the county and the planning of the county, whether it's our transportation system, our land use and development plans, our recycling, our energy plan. A stormwater management, it all came together. Um, the thing I'll, I'll say is that right now in this time when the federal government has abrogated their responsibility, everybody knows that more responsibility and opportunity rests with local governments, state governments, and the private sector, as Katie said. And we're a model for that. And that's what's really cool about this. Local governments all over are needing to step up, and we've been doing it for the last 10 or 15 years, and this is a really wonderful acknowledgement of that. And Katie, and as you said, we can still do even more. So it's going to be an ongoing effort, correct? Oh, yeah. It will be. I mean, one of the signature centerpieces, I suppose, of Arlington's commitments has been our community energy plan, which Jay led uh, the initiation of. And it's time to update that energy plan. We'll be doing some of that work in 2018, revisiting right. the targets and some of our objectives. Right. Uh, and this is just all the more motivation to, to keep pressing forward right. and offer some leadership, right. as Jay mentioned. Should be doing that now. <laughs> and guess and what? speaking yeah, of. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> One other thing I'll say is that um, in Virginia, we have this Dillon rule everyone talks about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there are a lot of local governments that have a lot more authority to mandate things happen. This happened. Not having that authority, but finding creative ways to incentivize and partner. Uh, our private sector is right in there with us, and that's not to be assumed. We have to keep working at that. Well, and that's something that doesn't happen everywhere. That's something that that's the entire exactly community right. here in Arlington has made it's this embraced. commitment. Absolutely. It's part of the vision. Okay. But, Jay, oh. this is it. It's swan song time. Yeah. Um, as all, most of you may know, Jay is stepping down from the board, retiring yep. after 20 years. Yep. You've Long seen time. a lot in here in Arlington County in that time. Kara, I've loved it. I mean, I've, it's, as I say to everybody, it's been a labor of love. Um, you refresh yourself along the way. You find new challenges. You get to work with new people like Katie, like Christian. Um, every board has its own uh, character and its own identity. Uh, but with the community behind us, with the private sector in there, you know, we have stayed true to that vision and refined it each time along the way. So I, I've loved the work. I mean, it's really exciting to actually see change happen, to actually not only do the plan, inherit a plan, refine a plan, but it's not just a plan. You actually are doing it. You're adopting, you know, uh, building developments and seeing stormwater, seeing, you know, your transit plan come to life in your community. Uh, it's really exciting. It's an exciting job. It always has been. And I really look forward to watching these guys continue uh, moving Arlington forward. Is there one thing you're proudest of over the two decades on the board? No, there really isn't. I mean, uh, you know, a lot of people think it's a project. Uh, you know, there are plenty of individual projects. Every time you drive down the street, you see another one that you, you maybe you, you influenced a little bit or you were there. But it's more the, the, the 20 years of being in a role of being able to listen to people, help guide and lead the community through that kind of change. And no, we keep moving forward, that we haven't stopped. We haven't had this rollback and um, that we are a community that can continue to move forward. And having a role in that, sort of stabilizing that and leading through that is very rewarding. Every time I drive around, I feel good in Arlington. And of course, it's probably going to be keeping a close eye as the board moves forward <laughs> into 2018. We hope so. Joy, Jay yeah. joins a pretty <laughs> distinguished group of former board members. You know, a lot of folks who, uh, after stepping off the board, have continued to play incredible leadership roles in our community and on a personal level have been amazing mentors to those who followed behind them. So we're not letting Jay go too far. 
<laughs> we won't get rid of us all that easy. And the staff are all here, That's right? right. <laughs> I mean, they're a huge part of the success mm -hmm. of this community, so Absolutely. they're all still here. And of course, our new board member will join us in January. We're yeah. looking forward to it. Oh, yeah. Eric Gutschall, a great addition. He'll be a wonderful addition. I, I don't think anyone has been more prepared to start on day one with the work he's done in this community over many years, um, already showing it, through his volunteerism how much he cares and taking the next step to, to do that same kind of work through a position on the county board. I'm really excited and pleased that he's there. Okay, and I'm sure you'll be keeping a close eye as yeah. things move forward. <laughs> um, well, that's going to do it for County Board Wrap for 2017. Thank you, Jay and Katie, for joining us for this last show of the year. We'll see you in the new year when we have a new County Board Chair and Vice Chair, as well as, of course, a new Board Member. If you want to watch County Board meetings, they're live streamed and archived on the county's website, arlingtonva.us. Just search County Board. And remember to tell us what you think about these issues and more by going to topics.arlingtonva.us slash engage. We'll be back again next year. We'll see you then. But of course, before we go, Jay, you know, you, as most people know, we haven't talked about it lately, but you, of course, have been kind of a, a leader in the environmental sustainability movement here in Arlington, yeah. specifically when it comes to things like water recycling and water bottles. So we here at Arlington TV uh -huh. found it okay. only She's appropriate. Off She's <laughs> off script. I'm, I'm going rogue here today. And those of us here oh. at Arlington TV <laughs> with your very own heavy duty. Oh, yeah. And if you read on there, it says it's one long chug of water, three lemonades, <laughs> or four mint juleps. These are the guidelines that it gives for this okay. water bottle. So I love practical things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you I know. <laughs> Jay, That's we're going to miss you. Thanks. And definitely don't be a stranger. <laughs> um, and from all of us here at Arlington TV, happy holidays and have a wonderful new year. <laughs>